I first met Rafe a year ago at SUNYCON in New York City and was immediately impressed with his professionalism and his commitment to higher education. Rafe heads up our operations in Lebanon. You'll hear more about that shortly. Indeed, few individuals experience a challenge that Rafe does, and we talked about that many times, running a SUNY International Studies program in one of the most complex, one of the most challenging, and one of the most dangerous regions in the world. But as so many others from the Middle East have observed, you can decry politics and current events and still love your country passionately and still hope for better days. From my first conversations with Rafe, I sensed this was what he believed. This program and the two other programs we have hosted this year on immigration policy could not be more timely. Two weeks from today, we will participate in an election that this year has largely focused on immigration policy. In this election, if you vote one way, families like Rafe's, regardless of need, would be turned away and citizenship would be an impossibility, regardless of circumstance. Vote another way and you would be supporting the notion that those from throughout the world desiring an opportunity to come to America might someday have that hope. Can you imagine a more compelling appeal for electoral participation? Without further ado, I would like to turn the program over to our moderator, Professor James Ketterer from Bard College for the formal introduction of our speaker in today's conversation. Jim, I turn it over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Bob, and thank you everyone for, for being here. Uh, Rafe and I have known each other for several years, and um, when we talked about this event, we thought that it would be best to just invite you into one of the many conversations we've had over the years, rather than have this be a formal Q&A or formal presentations, that this really will be a conversation that we'll have for a while, and that when Bob gives us the high sign, we will open up to, to the crowd, and, and you, can, you can also join in with uh, questions, and hopefully there'll be some answers. Um, Rafe, when I first met you, I was still working at SUNY. It's nice to be back here at a SUNY institution. <laughs> um, and uh, I was immediately um, struck by your last name because it gave me the sense that you might be from a small town that I had been to in, in Lebanon that actually has uh, a university at Albany connection, uh, Dor Schweier. Of course. And, and I asked you, and you said that, that yes, you are. So for those of you in the room who remember Professor Abdo Baklini, this was also his hometown. Um, and I worked on a, a US agency for international development project um, for Professor Baklini uh, many years ago, and ended up going to, to that very beautiful town in the mountains in, in Lebanon. Um, but it's also a town that is historically important for not only Lebanon, but, but that region. Um, and I was thinking about it today and remembering that the, the Lebanese uh, scholar uh, who spent his career in the United States, Fuad Ajami, um, starts his book, Dream Palace of the Arabs, in talking about a poet who came from, from that town, a poet who ended up working at the American University in uh, Beirut, uh, Khalil Hawi. Um, who had been very much involved in uh, the politics of greater Syria. Um, and this gets us eventually into the questions of Syria and borders and the creation of modern <laughs> Lebanon that your book also talks about. Um, but uh, Khalil Hawi was famous not only for his poetry, but also um, because he committed suicide symbolically as Israel invaded Lebanon in 1982. And this is the way in which um, Ajami begins his book to set the scene about the dream palace that he feels the Arabs have created. And in many ways, this book for Ajami was, um, it ended up being his last great work, um, but also was kind of an apology for the previous books that he had written, The Arab Predicament and others, um, in which it was perceived that he was blaming uh, the Arab nations for many of the things that had befallen them. And it was saying, um, with some retrospective on it, that this is a much more complex and nuanced story. So anyway, that's a long way of introduction without really talking about you, but talking about how we met and the kinds of things that a last name 
in, in the Middle East can evoke. All of those sorts of things, all the connections to here, to there, um, and to, 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 to poetry and to everything else. Um, so, so then on to, to um, the you, book. You know, names do de depict uh, places, you know, like yes. Ajami himself in, in Arabic. Ajami right. means Persian. His origin right. would, be, would be Persian. You know. Right, he's uh, Shia. Shuwayri, I come from the village of Shuwayri. Uh, Trabulsi comes from Tripoli. So it's, uh, it's either this or it depicts a, uh, a craft. Like Haddad, Haddad is the uh, metal worker. Uh, Najjar is the is the uh, carpenter. Ketterer in German, Khuri. He's a chain maker. Khuri wow. is the is the priest, and you have Khuris across the whole denominations in, in the whole spectrum of denominations in, in the Middle East, because you have priests practically every single family, you know. So it's Khuris and in, uh, in everywhere. Yeah. So you you um, decide to write a story about um, many things that are woven into the story of, of your family as well. And so I, what do you think that you were hoping to learn out of this process? And what were you hoping that other people would learn out of, from this book? Well, many, many answers to this, to this question. Uh, certainly, I've always wanted to learn the history of my own country, to start with this. And you know, I was, I was so very ashamed when you know, my daughter comes with her history book. From, from school, and she needed assistance. And I was reading through this history book, um, you know, a 10 year old hi history book. We are teaching them history, fabrications, not, not the actual history itself. What suits the purpose? I mean, you were talking of the castles made by the Arabs, and we kind of fabricate information because of the different denominations, because of different clans and tribes. So, in a, in a way, you have to kind of give some sort of a history that that is you comfortable that everybody is, is agreeable to it. This is history. This is how we <coughs> teach history in, in level today. So I want to do something else, something different, a people's history uh, for, my, for my children to start with. You know, this is the history of your country. I've written this book for my kids. This is how I announced it originally. But first and foremost, you know, when I started on this enterprise, it was because of Sally. I mean, Sally Crimmins Vilala had, had me going on a fellowship for international education. and. Because of this fellowship, I've been going across the whole of the state of New York, uh, from campus to campus, talking to students and faculty on development. And probably I've seen more of the state of New York than most of you here. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and funny enough, you know, I've been meeting with people who, who have Lebanese descent. Every time you know, I went to a college to speak, they knew there was a Lebanese visiting. So you know, I had people in the, in the, in the uh, attendance who came up afterwards. I said, well, I have, I have, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Lebanese. I come, I have Lebanese origins. So I found myself in a game of, uh, of you know, exchanging uh, ancient history, uh, like how they made it to New York State and why that in Utica, say, and with what's happening in Lebanon today. And it was funny because you know, at one at one point, I realized that there was a kind of a common denominator among across the board. Like all of them had something had a different story, but there is something common to all of them. Uh, resilience, like there were so very strong, resilient people coming out here. You know, um, uh, on vessels unknown uh, to destinations unknown to uh, to a country that you know didn't have social security or insurance or or money. You still needed a twenty dollar bill to get across Ellis Island. That's um, but apart from this, you know, it's uh, going in in the unknown. I mean, we, we, when we fly today, we have our credit cards, we have our reservations. Uh, you know, you even get a message. I just got a message from United and that I have to get my boarding pass for tomorrow's flight. I'm going to New Orleans in the morning. So it's kind of everything is kind of. And if we go out of this, we kind of get lost. They have resilience. And so I had this idea of kind of doing more research in this. And I had a grandfather myself who, who came here. He came here in 1902. I never understood the story of this grandfather because, because he, was, he was very silent about his own, his, his own story, what he did here. But what I know is that he made, he made capital, he made money, and he invested his money back in Lebanon, and he died a very, very wealthy man in 1956. So what did he do in Louisiana? I'd, I'd like to go and do the same. What did he do? <laughs> and, and it so happened that, you know, working uh, with, with SUNY on, on projects in Lebanon, one of our partners is the Higher Education for Development. It's a fine organization. So with Rosemary Oatlieb, you know, the fellow for Lebanon, we went to Louisiana on this conference. And when I went to Louisiana, I did what every good researcher, every good academic, and every good 
grandson would do is chase after my grandfather. So I went after his, his, my grandfather and I found out cousins from the Aoun family who turned Owen, from the Showeli family who turned Joseph, no less than 350 families who live across there, who are cousins basically. So it's, it, it was exciting. And the findings were exciting. And the memory of my grandfather, 110 years after, you know, still lingers, still is there. And so in, I turned to Donna and I said, OK, we have the story, so let's publish this. Uh, and I said, I would like to go back and to the ancestry, further behind. And how about if we did a series of books, like one for each? <laughs> And being the, uh, uh, you know, the, the very clever publisher and, you know, uh, so she said, no, it's going to be one book. So go do, you, go, go, go do your homework and come, come, up, come back with one, one big book. And, and so we did. You know, it's, uh, it, was, it was good because, you know, in there we had, like, immigration to the U.S. But what I found out is lots of migrations within. Like, I went as, as far back as, as 1788 with this ancestor. Faris Buzaid Mujais from Shoe. Right. How did this Mujais bloke end up in Hadad? I wanted to understand this. So I traced this all the way. And it's a series of migrations. And the funny thing is that with every generation, you had a different aspect, a di different face of Lebanon, a different socioeconomic and political Lebanon. So it started under the Imam and then moved on to different uh, socio political. Uh, and economic uh, Lebanon, and this is you know what 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 was interesting. It was it turned out to be Lebanon in the making, the making of a country, but told by these these characters from Fadis Bouzid Mujais, who in 1788 was raising silkworms in his small village in uh, at age of 14, at the time when the Declaration of Independence was being drafted. In, in the U.S., you see, it's kind of and uh, long before the state of Lebanon was even conceived of. Of course, I mean, this is in the the heart of the the Ottoman Empire. Of course, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it really is the making of of Lebanon. Uh, I mean, even when your your grandfather came, there was no Lebanon. <laughs> he he went out under the uh, the Sultan Abdul Hamid, and he came back under the French uh, uh, the French mandate. And in the meantime, he uh, you know. The World War One, and he was drafted when he was here, because he, he left here as a national, as a national, as an American citizen, and he was drafted in 1970. So he didn't get to go to the front because the war was 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 over by then. But when he went to Lebanon, he went under the French banner. Do you know the um, the flag for Lebanon, the very first flag for Lebanon, 1920? It's the French tricolor flag with a C that pin, pinned in the middle. We had this for six years. That was our flag, the national flag for Lebanon. That's funny, isn't it? It's funny as one word for it. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, but it, I mean, it's it's useful for for us to remember that that these borders that um, were created in this period a hundred years ago, um, as your grandfather was in in uh, Louisiana, that these are the very borders that are being contested, perhaps being reformulated now. Um, uh, but before we get to that part of the story, because there's a lot to talk about with, with that, I mean, as you were going around New York State, as you've been going back to, to Louisiana and to other places to, to talk about this book, and you say Lebanese are coming to, to chat with you. You know, it just, um, I think it's also interesting because there's a, there are different kinds of Lebanese um, communities that have settled in the United States in different waves um, over time. In upstate New York uh, and throughout New England, this was a population that came around the time that your grandfather did, the late 1800s, yeah. in, into the very beginning of the 1900s, in Khalil Gibran yeah, course, came at this time famously. Um, uh, there's communities in, in Utica and Syracuse, uh, outside of Buffalo. Um, and and th you know the way in which these communities kind of establish themselves as a diaspora community and establish ties among themselves, I think are the very things you ended up finding as you traveled around the state and and met these people. Yeah, of course. People who have come more recently, I think, have a, um, they're coming for different reasons. Um, oftentimes, in and 
difficult circumstances for different difficulties. Um, and I think uh, have had a more difficult time, maybe because of the tenor of the politics in this country, um, the economics or what have you. The, I don't think it's a lack of resilience that the earlier waves of people had, but um, there's different dynamics. So as you've met these different populations, I mean, what have, what's been your experience? Well, it's the different, as, as you said, in populations, different purposes. You know, it's more economic, it's more, uh, you know, what's happening in the region, uh, in, in the Middle East at large today. You know, I mean, you can't exclude Lebanon. If you look at Lebanon on the, on the map, it's but the fly on the back of the elephant. I mean, it's, it's a, such a small country. You have the Mediterranean on the western side, uh, on the western flank. Then you have Israel, Palestine on the south, and then the rest of it is all of Syria. And the deep hinterland is, is Iraq and, and the Gulf countries. So basically, we have a, an array of, of inviolable neighbors. I mean, this, how can you live that where, when, when the population is very young at age? So we graduate how many students every year? And where do they go? What do they work at? So it's, it's, uh, it's a brain drain. And people are going for economic reasons, but also for security reasons. You know, they, they need to think in terms of uh, securing the future, future for, their, for, their, for their siblings, for their children, basically, which, which is not something, you know, uh, very easy to, to, to do today. But, and you yourself experienced this. Of course. Uh, leaving. Of course. And returning, just as your grandfather did, to leave and return. Uh, we've done this, my, as a family, we've done this five times, yeah. We've, I've been a refugee uh, five times, yeah. So... 76 was my first experience at, at, at playing refugee. Because, you mean, know, there are Again, places. my family comes from... Has, has, has means, which means that, I mean, this, again, is the story with the Syrians today. You have refugee population, but, you know, some of them have the means to, uh, to pay for their, for their travels and for their accommodations, which, in a way, has, has brought business <laughs> onto some countries. And even Lebanon has had this small margin of profit, well, certain private initiatives from Syrian refugees fleeing into Lebanon. But again, Lebanon has been just the, uh, the, uh, the layover before get, getting the visa to come to the US, because they had the means to do that and buy property and, and, and establish here. The, um, uh, as you go around and, and you talk to people who are not from Lebanon or not from the Middle East, what are the kinds of things that you, you wish they could know about the Middle East to make more sense of it. Because, you know, in my experience <laughs> in, with students and, and in giving public talks, um, so much of what you have to do in the United States when you, you want to have people have a more complex, nuanced view of the Middle East is to kind of um, have them unlearn the thing, the wrong things that they've, they've learned. So whether it's from your book or just in general, in your conversations with people, what, what do you think is missing from the conversation that would help? Let me return the question. Uh, do you think, I mean, you said you're an expert in, in, in the Middle East, you've been in the Middle East many times, I mean, the last of which was, was your position in, in Egypt, and you were there when, when they had this winter of discontent, as I call it, you know. Um, do you think, uh, Televisions, the news today, the newspapers give the right picture, the good picture of what's happening uh, in the Middle East today. Well, I think you know the answer to that. No, I mean, <laughs> no. But, but then the question is, why? Why is that the case? You know, why? Why um, do we see in the newspapers and in television portrayals and movies? It's in our political narratives. Um, why do we see uh, these? Um, caricatures that are being presented. Um, is it a function of US foreign policy? Is it just a function of how far away we are? Um, is it a function of fear uh, or, or all, of the, all of the above? Um, which I, I would say it's probably all of the above and, and a good dose of, of isolation, the, you know, the small number of Americans who have passports, et cetera. Um, so I, I, think that, I think that's part of of the answer. Um, I, I think the complexities and the nuances get lost. People don't, they, they, the things that they end up assuming are true um, about, uh, you know, this kind of monochromatic view of the region, um, everything from Morocco all the way to, to Iran, 
um, and assuming everything is, um, is one kind of population that has one sort of life and one sort of history. Um, I, I think that's, a, that's an unfortunate starting point, and a lot of it flows from there. We, at one point, we had a, a, um, a, a technician coming from a university in, in Canada to work at, uh, at Al-Qathar Foundation. And that was before 2006. And then he heard of, well, like everybody had heard about the clashes in Afghanistan. So he sends an email to say, I'm not coming any, any longer. I said, why is it you're not coming to Lebanon? He said, because you, Lebanon is not far from Afghanistan. And that was that, because this is the whole, you know, the whole Middle East. Countries have interests. Countries don't have friends. Nations have interests. Right. How, and this is, you know, a question that I've, I've, I've always kind of thought about. What sort of connection is there between administrations and media? Because in many occasions, I, I feel that media relays the interest of administrations and not the proper realities on the ground. What is your answer to that? My personal answer to that. Well, I mean, so President Obama came in with great fanfare. His, his first Actually, his second major international speech was in Cairo. It was meant to be a reset of U.S. relations, uh, not just in the Middle East, but in the broader Muslim world. And um, uh, it was received very well. When, when by the time I moved to, to Cairo in 2011, uh, people were still very um, positive about that speech. But over the, those next three years, things um, degenerated quite substantially, not just in U.S.-Egyptian relations, but, but across the region. Um, I don't know if, it is, uh, if, if that is a specific playing out of American interests that then kind of burst the bubble of that initial optimism, or if it's part of, some people would say it's part of the American pivot away from the Middle East to, to Asia, um, and we can see Obama's reluctance to intervene in Syria mm -hmm. as part of that. Um, or if it is also just making a series of mistakes based on a lack of understanding uh, the, of the consequences of American actions in the, in the region. I mean, Lebanon has been a place where this has played out time and again. We've seen the, the bombing of the U.S. Embassy. Um, we still saw the bombing nice. of the Marine barracks. Um, we've seen, you know, Reagan uh, reverse course very, very quickly. Uh, we now have our, our diplomats there who uh, they still call it a danger post. They can very rarely leave the embassy, and if when they do that, only in armored cars with lots of machine <laughs> guns waving out the window. Um, you know, the, the Lebanon has been kind of a venue in which the Americans and the French and before that the Ottomans have played out all of these sorts of stories. So, you know, you see this woven through, through your book as well and the course, history of, of your course. family. Of course. I mean, uh, every single uh, country had, has its intelligence in Lebanon. And we were talking in the car with Rosemary today, and I was saying, if there were people living on Mars, we'd, we'd have a uh, Martian uh, intelligence in Lebanon. Also, you know, it's, it's, it's brewing in, in Lebanon. And in a, in a funny way, also, you need this kind of um, no man's kind of zone uh, where when war is playing all around where you can kind of retreat and have, have kind of the operation room, as, as I would call it. But you get this, some people have the sense now that Lebanon, with the end of this, the 15 year civil war in 1990, um, uh, which you know, I think still in the American imagination is the thing that defines Lebanon and um, the hostages that were taken, et cetera. But um, that it, it's, it's in a precarious stability, even though there have been all kinds of conflicts. Um, and there have been further invasions. Um, but uh, if you look around the region, it seems to be relatively stable by comparison. Nevertheless, you know, I've, I've just been doing some reading on how the conflict in mm -hmm. Syria is affecting the Lebanon, Lebanese political situation. You have been in a political crisis now for, for quite some time, um, but also affecting the power dynamics of one of the key players in the, the political system, one that I think very much resonates in the American uh, ear, and that's uh, Hezbollah. That Hezbollah is very clearly a player 
in supporting Assad, in working with the Iranians, in projecting power uh, through Europe and carrying out attacks, but also in, in helping to maintain this political crisis within Lebanon. Um, where do you see that going? Well, I mean, look at the whole region as globally it's and and do the analysis from the perspective not of lebanon as such because if we did we wouldn't understand much but look at the grander picture uh, the sunni shia divide is very very crucial uh, what's happening in the gulf countries today with the uh, uh, with the fall of, of the uh, of the oil prices like saudi arabia is in a big mess uh, they lost a hundred billion dollars last year which was just about the ninth of them of the of the reserves, and now they are pushing for 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 uh, economic uh, measures, and measures will will not be easy on the Saudis at large. Uh, left on its own, I don't think Saudi Arabia could survive much longer. Uh, so what's going to happen with the whole reconfiguration of the of the of the area at large, and certainly with one major player, which is Iran today, uh, and what the Saudis have tried to do by kind of uh, leaving the, the market open for oil instead of kind of uh, chunking, chunking down the quantities to limit the, the price, they thought they could uh, get the Iranians to supply, and the Iranians didn't, which, which makes the case stronger today to say, well, the Iranians may be looking at, at, at going global in terms of, of, Middle East, of Middle Eastern affairs. And Hezbollah, in that sense, comes in, comes in very handy. Now, Syria, I mean, Syria, there is no longer one Syria. I mean, what will happen in, in Aleppo, I think, will be determined, will determine the course of action. If the Syrian army regains Aleppo, which seems to be the case with the, with the, with, with the support and, and, and help of the Russian aviation. Huh? So if they recapture uh, Aleppo, this would bring about what the what media has called at one point the useful Syria, which would fall under Assad again, which is from Aleppo to Damascus, and this engulfs Lebanon completely, uh, leaving the Kurdish Syria independent. And yeah. then the hinterland, you know, the Syrian desert, basically, would be for the, the rebels and, and, and whatnot. So yeah. if this happens, this would kind of remap the whole country. This is the neo sykes -Sykes pico if you want. Right. I mean, I think it's, it's worth remembering that the, the end of the 15-year civil war in Lebanon um, was followed, not by accident, with a 15-year occupation by Syria, um, which was largely done uh, with the uh, complicity of the United States government, who in 1990 wanted the Syrians on board for something else, which was uh, the Gulf War. Of course. Um, so all of these, of course, as you're saying, all fit together. I recently saw a map that was describing what you're talking about, this, this Sunni-Shia divide, as it transcends all the, the borders in, in the region, versus the map of the, that we, we refer to, of the modern Middle East. Um, and it was saying this this is the Middle East that we'll be dealing with going going forward. This is the the new Sykes Pico Sykes Pico being the, the diplomatic agreement that in some part created the Middle East that we have today between the, the British and the French um, dividing up the Middle East as, as World War One came to an end. Um, but back to you, so that how it relates to your family and, and your your story. Uh, reading your book, um, it's all compelling, of course, but for the things that I'm interested in, I study and the experiences that I have, I found the, um, the creation of, of your foundation and all the things that that was doing amidst these other things going on in Lebanon and in the region to be a really compelling story that um, not only it was conceived of, but brought to fruition. I mean, that's, that's an amazing story. Um, maybe you could just elaborate for those here who haven't yet read the book uh, mm -hmm. on what, what that foundation was meant to do and what, what it does. Well, it's, it's the calling of, a, of an individual that started in 1956, 1957, the day uh, my grandfather passed away. You know, the, the grandfather who came back from Louisiana and who made, who made fortune, basically, uh, and by buying property in Lebanon you know, in nickels and dimes at that stage. So he, he died a very wealthy man. And in 1956, my father earns a substantial wealth from, from the passing of, of his father. And uh, he had a calling. I mean, a 
call it half, I, as I used to say to him, you know, uh, laughingly, I used to say, you're, you're, you're half a prophet and half a madman you know, to, to do what you did. Like, you, I mean, what would you do if, you know, uh, you had tomorrow morning a considerable wealth falling in your lap? I mean, I know many who would go buy horses and cars and travel to Monaco. And, but he had, he saw it differently. He, he wanted to, you know, he looked at the dispossessed in Lebanon, the fragile populations, and, and gave to them. And he, he started, you know, uh, institute after institute, you know, center after center, and uh, giving care to the elderly, giving, you know, rehabilitation and medical care to people with disabilities, and, and starting schools for mainstream education, and so on and so forth. And because he was an economist himself, I mean, he graduated from the American University of Beirut at that stage, one of the early uh, masters in, in economics. He turned his wealth into an endowment instead of kind of spending it. And so he spent basically the revenue on this endowment, which he knew how to place because this was his specialty. And we still have this endowment today, which has kind of developed in, in, in time, and it serves today no less than 6,000 people every day in, in Lebanon. So that's considerable. And that was my, that's the message I'm going to convey to the, uh, uh, to the people in Louisiana. I'm going there tomorrow, in fact. I'm speaking. I'm the featured author at the um, uh, Louisiana Book Festival this year. I'm, I'm, the honor is to speak at the Senate chamber. So it's going to... And, you know, uh, we had this funny joke in the car today, and I was saying, well, you know, what if my grandfather had returned to Louisiana? Because he went in 19, 1920 to to take a wife from the village, yeah, because that's the, the thing to do, and come back to Louisiana and live in Louisiana. But she resisted him, and she said, you have to choose between Louisiana and me. And so she won the day, and he ended up staying. And I, I just for the fun of it, and the you know, intellectual kind of, uh, I said, what, what if my grandfather did come back to Louisiana, and what if I was born in Tulane Hospital in New Orleans instead of... Uh, uh, AUB hospital in Beirut, you know, I would have made it to the, to the Senate chamber probably on my own, you see. <laughs> so. I have no doubt. <laughs> the, the Landrews and others would have uh, had real competition. That's Churchill's yes. word, I have, to, I have to admit. I've stole these words to Churchill. I mean, he said these at the Congress, you know, at the uh, mm -hmm. Second World War. He was trying to bring the Americans, as you know, but into the war. And thank, thankfully he did, and thankfully you did. Otherwise, you know, the... Uh, Sykes speaker would have been remodeled a second time for, for, the, for, for the Middle East, you know. But, but you know, Louisiana also has a kind of a special place in the American imagination. I mean, it, it struck me in reading your book, if your grandfather had gone somewhere else, not only would you not have such a good title for your book, but I mean, it would have been a very different kind of experience. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to bring up any other place he might have gone and disparage it, but that... He went to this place uh, that, that is so seen as exotic to most Americans and, and unusual and has an unusual history um, and also has a, a francophone history, um, has a different kind of legal code. I mean, it's just, uh, it, it's, it's a different place in, in the United States. And so it happenstance perhaps, but um, one that, that clearly worked both for him and for a story to write generations later. Of course. Uh, well, uh, Louisiana was, it was a good attraction for Arabs in general and, and Lebanese at that stage. That was, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the last 15, 20 years of the, of the 19th century. Uh, and in fact, they could come directly to Louisiana instead of going through Ellis Island at that stage. And funny enough, when I was doing the research work in, in, in Louisiana itself, uh, went to the, I went to the library, to the Louisiana State Library, and they had the Daily Picayune, the, the newspaper. On, on, I thought they would be on microfilms, like spending a whole day on microfilms. To my surprise, they had it all on, on computers. And you could actually research, like a research engine, like on Google, basically. You kind of research the daily Picayune for, for keywords that go all the way back to the, uh, to the early times of the Picayune. So it was easy to research this. And funny enough, I, I, I fall on hostels and, and hotels, family-owned hotels, that were owned by Lebanese people in Louisiana at the, at the turn of the century. It was that popular. Well, it's, it's the big Mississippi Avenue, which was the economic avenue, artery, basically, for the whole of the, of the United States. This is what made New Orleans so, so important at that stage. And certainly the gateway for the very first uh, ready-to-eat meal at that stage, which was banana. And it came from the Caribbean. So you had banana coming in, which was a ready-to-eat meal. You know, it was your, your first hamburger. That, that's it, your first <laughs> McDonald's of the, of the day, you know. So it was, it was bananas, you know. 
And it, it, it was the, the gateway to the Mississippi. So this is why he came down there and, and started working there. He, he, never, he didn't go to school. My grandfather couldn't read and write. But he had what we call the flair in business. He had flair. And he, he, he went down there, and he worked in New Orleans peddling. And, and then he thought, well, you know, ready-to-wear ready to clothing was, didn't make it to the markets yet. So he went down to Lockport, just on the barriers, basically, where people, you didn't have stores, you didn't have, you know, uh, Costco's and, and supermarkets. So he, he went down there, and he, and he went selling uh, communion robes to the children, workwear to the, to the fishermen and the trappers and the farmers. And that's, that's how he, and ready, to, ready, to, ready to, to wear. This is how he made his money. But because he was so generous, he would, he would leave, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever clothing he was selling. And if the people couldn't pay, he would collect later. So he, he left, he left a, a, good, uh, a good name, which uh, I, I, I was able to kind of uh, uh, trace it back. They called him Sweet Papa, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, Creole. Um, very um, uh, affectionate. You lose the name. They don't call you by your name no longer. Uh, funny enough, you know, it's it's uh, some of them. Uh, one of them said that I only uh, knew what my my cousin's name was in the uh, in the necrology uh, after he passed away, mm -hmm. because we've always called him so and so. Um, there are lots of jokes about this. You know, it's uh, so sweet, Papa. He was, and they wouldn't even know who he who what country he came from. And he spoke the same patois. And he had his chanting the same, basically, selling, um, selling, selling uh, uh, you know, songs. And it's, it was good to kind of feel this. You know, and that's, uh, it's quite rewarding in, in a way. You know. um, Bob, how are we doing on time? Should we? Uh... Another uh, five or 10 minutes, we can go to Q&A. OK. Uh, so, the, uh, so jumping then back to, to the modern Middle East, um, what, what sorts of uh, questions do you get as you, you know, you're going to, to Louisiana when, it, when it's not about the, the Lebanese diaspora, but when it's a, people here in the Middle East, what, what kinds of things are, are, are people wanting to, to talk about it, beyond the, the kinds of things we were just mentioning? There's a deep miscomprehension of what the Middle East is about and how it came to be mapped out. I mean, you did say in early in uh, um, when we started, you talked about Howie and the Greater Syria. Uh, so, what was this Greater Syria? You know, uh, when my grandfather left Lebanon, there were no countries. There was Syria, full stop. Uh, it used to even be called Bilad Sham. Right. You know, at that stage, uh, if you go back in history, the early centuries, um, the north, the geographers didn't take the north. As as uh, as the uh, the point of direction, they took the east. So if you stood in Najaf in the Gulf and looked east, you any, all the countries that were to your right, Yemen, were called Bilad al Yemen, our Yemen today, and all the countries to the left were called Bilad al Sham, Sham being Shemal, which is the left. So you have Yemen and Sham. Sham turns to be Damascus, the capital of Syria today. So all of these countries, basically, the countries of the main affluence, the main rivers, you have the Tigris, you have the Euphrates, yeah? then you have the Litani in Lebanon and the Jordan River. So this caps, in a way, the, the, the desert, which is just the Arab Gulf states today. And this, sometimes called Greater Syria, sometimes called the Fertile Crescent, because Maybe it's fertile crescent. We, we even see the, the word sham, the name, returning now in the conflicts that we, we see in of the course. region. So when people say Daesh, that stands for Dalat al-Islamiya fi Iraq wa sham. Of course. Um, of course. Islamic and why, state why so? in Iraq wa, wa sham. And, and why so? And so they're drawing on this period predating Sykes-Picot. Sykes-Picot, predating the crusaders who came in and carved up the area in their, in their conception. When Baghdadi went into, uh, from Iraq, when he went into Syria, it was a triumph because they broke the barriers. They broke Sykes-Picot. Right. And this is when they talked of the caliphate, basically, of going back to this greater Syria principle, which predated the Sykes-Picot agreement. And now we, we even have uh, Erdogan in Turkey saying, we never agreed to these borders. 
these borders were foisted upon us. Uh, and we'd like to have some say as they're starting to get resorted. Um, meanwhile, you have the State Department that's, that is still saying, you know, this is Syria. This is the state of Syria. This is the state of Iraq. Um, and uh, irrespective of what might else be going on, we're going to adhere to these borders nevertheless. Um, if you take Sykes-Picot and look at the maps, it's in the book also. I mean, I, I made a comparison between the Sykes-Picot, which was the ag actual agreement, right. and how they mapped it up between the French and the English, yeah? So they said, from uh, Kirkuk to Karak, a line in the sand, and then to Jaffa on the Mediterranean, Everything south of this is, is, is French. Everything north of this is English. That was it. I mean, they included, the, they included the Russians at first. And Italians, and that came later. Right, but the Russians had, you know, they had other things to, to do when they had their Apart own revolution. From Jerusalem, which was meant to be a condominium. So French, English, Jerusalem was a condominium. If you look at the Treaty of Sèvres in France, which put this Sykes-Picot into implementation a few years later, you see differences, minor differences, like Mosul, for instance, was turned to the English, because they, the English renegotiated this. We want Mosul. We'll give you something else, because Mosul, you have the oil. This is exactly what Erdogan is talking about, Mosul. This, this is what is prompting his comments. And Jerusalem was no longer a, a, a condominium. It went to the British <coughs> because of the uh, Balfour Declaration of creating a Jewish state in, in, Jews, in Israel. So it's kind of has all been V-shaped, remapped in, in the, but you have to look at the difference between this and that. So that's, that's, this is where you see the roots of many problems that the Middle East uh, lives today. Big questions like, you know, we, they just discovered that we have huge amounts of gas, natural gas, on the coast of Lebanon. Immense amounts of gas. We would be so wealthy beyond belief. Now, of course, when you have gas, you can't sell it. Like you can use it. You can, if you dig in, you use it. But you can't kind of export it unless you liquefy it. And liquefaction plants are so expensive. We're talking about billions of dollars. And they're so uh, volatile. And that's, you, you can't have liquefaction plants if uh, you, know, you have the Israeli Air, Air, Air Force or the uh, or the Hezbollah, or whatever vigilante groups shooting in the air. You know, so it's, uh, you need security. Perfect target, right. So this adds questions to the list, because, you know, uh, I am, a, you know, among the few, probably, who look at these multinationals, uh, the weapons industry and the, the, uh, the oil industry, as having a say in power politics today. Oh, for, for sure. But, but back to your, your uh, before we go to Q&A, what you were saying about the borders. So, I mean, a, a common narrative about the Middle East is, so these borders were drawn up by British and French diplomats. They were implemented by a treaty that was um, uh, written in France. The, it was a function of a European war that brought down the Ottoman Empire. These are, by, by definition, these are artificial borders. Um, and they should be redone in some way perhaps not in as violent a way as we, we see happening now, but they should, should be redone in some way that takes into account the real lived experience of people on the land. And, and it's, it's hard to disagree with that when you hear it, and, and it makes people say, okay, yeah, that sounds good. The <laughs> colonialists were mean, nasty people. They divided up these, the, these lands from afar, and we need to undo that mistake. I always say, though, to my students, one, what really is an artificial border versus a natural border? You know, is the border between Canada and the United States any more um, authentic? Um, is it, it's a straight line. It, uh, the people on both sides of the border, for most of it, speak the same language, have very similar experiences. Is that an artificial border or not? I'm not arguing for the record for the invasion of Canada, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, you know, just as, an, as a thought experiment. The other thing that I think is more troubling is that if we follow that to its logical conclusion in the Middle East, what we're really saying is we're going to give up on the notion of pluralist entities as nation states. We're going to say Kurdistan for the Kurds, um, 
uh, a Christian enclave for, for the Christians, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Shia space, Sunni space, and that's how we'll do the new borders. And you know, this kind of you know, ethnically pure state, um, you know, we've heard this before. We've heard this language before. It's troubling, and it doesn't end well. Um, and I, so I think Lebanon, um, which in this precarious balance, even after a very destructive civil war fighting about that balance, that it maintains itself in this pluralist way, I think stands as a model of some way to do it without drawing borders for ethnically monochromatic states. I don't know what your reaction to that I would mean, be. It's, uh it's it's uh, it's a way of portraying this definitely. I mean, this is what uh, Pope John Paul II had said when he came to Lebanon. He looked at Lebanon and said, "Well, Lebanon is is a mission. The Liban est une mission." He said, in using French words, um, because of this, because it has the mission of showing you know this pluralism. But I mean, if you take the map, the first map in the second gallery in, in, in the book, you'll see the confessional distribution in Lebanon, and you would see that. Every community has fenced, fences around and enclaves of different colors. You see the colorful map. And the, uh, the person who's done this map for the book, he called the, he called the map the Lebanese confessional mosaic. It's a mosaic, you know. It's, you know probably because of the, the uh, civil war that we have had, well, I would say civil wars that we have had, because you have to go back to the 1840s and for the first civil war between the Jews and the, and the Christians. And since, you know, they've been kind of living in separate cantons. Like, well, at one point during the civil war, they wanted to adopt the French, the, sorry, the Swiss system, and say, well, let's, let's do cantons in, in, uh, in, in Lebanon instead of having a one republic. And there is a confessional divide, and every community would kind of have external relations with the different proponents. And, and unfortunately, this is, this is how it plays out. And if I do follow the logic, then I would look at the state of Israel today and say, well, what is it? Is it a, uh, it is a democracy. No one can test that. But what, what is, is it a, uh, uh, taking into, into the, uh, the system of, of governance the, the Arabs in the region? Like if you take the state of Israel today with Gaza and the West, Gaza and the West Bank, you have together, I mean, the Eretz, Israel, you have 50% right. of them Jews, and the other 50% are, are Arabs. So, so where, does it, where does it leave us? Where does it leave us? The Muhammad Gaddafi at one stage, that, that's for the joke, he, he said, well, the only solution for, the, for Israel is to, is to create, I can't remember what he called it at that stage, he called it Isratin, I think, like Israel and Palestine, Isratin, he called it, that's, that's the game, he gave, the, the word he gave it. Like, he talked of a one-state solution before the hour. Like, unless they come together, unless they, they kind of build one state, go back to the plural, plural, pluralism you, you're referring to, they're going to be living in war forever and ever. So what's the answer to that? Who knows? Yeah, well, that's, I think, probably a good point at which to And I'd like to ask questions. a favor, if I could. We want to make sure that we capture all of the questions on our video. And so if you have a question, please raise your hand. Jim will call on you, and we'll bring a microphone. Please don't start speaking until the microphone reaches. OK. Richard. I just have okay. a question. I just, my question was just, um, when was the, the map redivided to separate everything? I just didn't understand that second drawing of the so, separation. So, I mean, much, much of the, it's not, it's not an exactly straight line, and nothing in history really is, but we can really date it, the creation of the modern Middle East, to uh, the period during and immediately following World War I. So the uh, the which resulted in the 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 final kind of collapse of the Ottoman Empire, right? I don't know if you want to add. Yeah, exactly. To that. Yeah, exactly that. That was you know the sykes Speaker agreement. You see, the British were playing the uh, the uh, the Emirs one against the other. They were pitting them once against the other at that stage. And now I think when it was Serb, this is when they signed the actual implementation of the sykes Speaker. And with the minor amendments, as I said earlier, and Mosul was was you know Eden in, in the UK wanted wanted the gas, the oil, and that was the the interest of the. Um... So there were there were three there were three things going on at the same time, not all aligned. One of them was that the British government was working with uh, Arab groups, particularly in the the Arabian Peninsula, seeking to have them 
uh, take on the Ottomans who were aligned with, uh, with the Germans. And so the, uh, they were looking kind of to, to take on the soft underbelly of, of um, their adversary. And they were saying, in return, you, you, the Arabs, will get something good out of this when the war comes to an end. And these were documented in something called the Hussein McMahon Correspondence and, and in T.E. Lawrence's, Lawrence of Arabia's book, The Seven Pillars of Wisdom. Um, and it's also still just one of the great movies um, to, to watch. Uh, at the same time, Reif had mentioned the Balfour Declaration, which was um, uh, sending out a signal that, the, that uh, there would be a Jewish homeland in the region. And then the third one was Sykes Pico. So people, that. you know, have have then called um, Israel the the twice or thrice promised land because <laughs> these promises that were made that were to various different entities with different kinds of results um, at Versailles and then at Sevres, the, the Arabs ended up not getting quite the deal that they had anticipated. But what they promised uh, Hussein, MacMahon, who was the commissioner in, in Egypt, because this is when, where they had the intelligence bureau. They called this the, 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 the Cairo Bureau, basically. Uh, and that came after they had lost against the Turks no less than 500,000 men in the Dardanelles, the war in Gallipoli, we call it today. I mean, th that's the name for it. They, were, they gave promises, they got promises to Hussein. Like, once we get rid of the Ottomans, we'll give you control of Syria. Hussein, who turns, I mean, Jordan today is the Hashemite kingdom, uh, and it's the descendants of Hussein who, who, have, who have Jordan now. But in the, in, in the same time, they were cutting other promises to the Saud family at that stage. And when the Ottomans were, were out, the British, took out the Hussein agreement and the declaration, all the, the letters of promises, uh, and gave it to the Saud, who associated with the Wahhabi sect, with the Ben Wahhab. And the Wahhabi sect is the fundamentalist sect, groups of, of, of Muslims that have given the, the, uh, the, uh, all, the, all the fundamentalist groups that we are basically uh, discovering today, because, you know, quite a few of them, aren't they? So it's kind of going back to the roots of this. Yeah. And there has been an incident, I think, which was very important. It was the 1967 war, the Six Days War. And this, this has been fundamental in kind of slapping uh, Nasser's Arabism and awakening the Muslim Brotherhoods in Egypt. Uh, if you can't do it to the peaceful means, that we go to arms. That was the consequence of the 1967 Six Days War also. So I think we have to kind of go back to these events and certainly back in history to understand this double waffle that the British were maintaining with the Arabs of the Peninsula. Hussein on one hand, the Saud on the other, and so on and so forth, to understand what's happening today. And Theodor Herzl and the Zionist movement as in, the third, yeah. In Basel, 1787, yeah. yeah. Uh, 1897, uh, and it was decided right. that there will be uh, a, a Jewish state in, in, in the state of Israel. At that stage, Israel had 7% in population of Jewish and 93% of Arabs. Although they specifically didn't use the word state. They said homeland. Homeland. They, homeland. they, they hedged the British on, on whether it would be a state. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> how far do we go back? How far do we go back <laughs> to sort it out? I'll, I would just like to congratulate uh, Sally and OIP and SUNY for keeping the John Ryan Fellowship ticking over. Uh, and I'd just like to remember Jack in that. Jack was the, the chancellor of the State University of New York for a period of time. A period during which I came to the State University. But it's interesting, his ideas about international relations and education were very interesting. As a young man, he and his wife came back from Thailand, from two years in Thailand, being a Fulbrighter there. And he saved up enough money uh, and saved up enough time 
for him and his wife and his three children to visit two places on the way home from Thailand, Istanbul and Beirut. He didn't want to go to London, Paris, and Rome. He <laughs> wanted to go to Istanbul and Beirut. And so it's fitting that, that right, you've got this John Ryan Fellowship because it speaks to exactly what Jack had in mind about what the world should be like, uh, about how educational institutions in our country should be trying to relate to other parts of the world. So I think he's up there watching this and he's pretty happy to see this book coming out. You know, what can we say about, this is the great use of the book. People need to know what happened. You know, and today almost no one takes the time to know what happens. Maybe it's just this funny year of politics that, that makes me think nobody knows what happened. At Jim's point about everybody having their own homeland, uh, a country that I spent two tours working in, one peaceful and one not so peaceful, is Somalia. Mm. Somalia is perhaps the most ethnically pure state <laughs> in the whole world. Every Somali can recite his heritage back to one Somali. But that doesn't mean they all get along together, <laughs> as you can see. <laughs> You know, Somalia is a failed state, maybe two failed states, <laughs> and it helps two, at least two, maybe three states around it also be on the edge of being failed states. The great example of Lebanon, I think, is, is the example it gives of working together in a multi-ethnic state, uh, realizing that, you know, there's got to be a place for everybody here. If we kick all these people out, Maybe that's not going to work out so well. And you know, you never do just get all the ethnic cleaning done. Some more show up. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's just the way it is. But right, thanks very much. I think Jack Ryan would be very proud of your book. Thank you, Excellency. You Thank done. you. And it's right fitting with what he had in mind. And what we had in mind when we created the Ryan Fellowship. You know, I also want to just uh, mention one of the things that Ambassador Gassende and I have spent a lot of time talking about and writing about and, and working on, um, and it's important um, in, in the Middle East uh, in two institutions, the American University in Cairo and, and a sister institution in, in Beirut, um, that are not American governmental institutions, but carry the name America. And uh, John Waterbury, the former president of AUB and, and professor at Princeton and a great scholar of the region, wrote a, a very important article call, that the headline says it all, hate your policies, love your institutions. <laughs> and so that across the Middle East, you see people that you know, don't like American policy, to put it mildly, but that these institutions carry out a, a very important role. Um, that having been said, as, as important as they are, as long as they've been there, there's only so much they can do. So how can we take that model and replicate it, but not replicate it in the same way to just create lots of other versions of the American University of fill in the blank? Because I, I think we've seen that that, has <laughs> the, 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 that replication model hasn't worked so well. But the international education model um, updated to, um, to move it beyond brain drain uh, to brain circulation, which I think is the story of your book. It's the story of, of the Middle East. It's the story of the Lebanese diaspora, where people are going back and forth, you said, five times. So it wasn't really drained off. It was coming no, back. Um, and and I, I think those institutions play that kind of central role for uh, that kind of track two diplomacy for the United States, but it's a much more complex world in this era of globalization, and we can see lots of other kinds of models and institutions that can work for, the, for Lebanon and the Middle East, and for the United States. You know, um, in case anyone hasn't noticed, whatever it is the United States is doing in the region isn't working out terribly well these days, and we might want to you know, have people read that Waterbury article again um, <laughs> in Foggy Bottom and, and kind of rethink um, what we might do. I think we'd have some good answers in this room about what we might do. 
And now it sounds like I have the answer, You're, but yes. Jim. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> it was something else that you said that I wanted to respond to. And thank you so much, Bob, for um, Ambassador Gassende for recognizing Raif's contribution as a John W. Ryan Fellow. And of course, Ambassador Gassende was the person who had the idea of establishing that fellowship. So that's a really very important endorsement. So thank you for that. Um, I think that the w what you're saying about the importance of uh, our institutions and the Waterbury quote, hate, hate your policies, love your institutions. Um, I think that's such an important point that you're bringing out and it's been really central to the work that we've done together with Al Khafat University in Lebanon and although it doesn't, it hasn't come out so much in today's conversation, that was really the birth of our partnership and the person who had that idea was Rosemary Ortley, our, um, she, was, she was at that time, uh, she became our fellow for Lebanon and now she's our fellow for capacity building partnerships. So um, that has evolved in a nice way. But really what we had was a capacity building partnership between SUNY and its institutions and al Khafat University, which as Raif sort of made mention of, serves an underserved population in Lebanon. Um, al Khafat Foundation serves the disabled, but the university serves not only the disabled community, but economically disadvantaged, geographically disadvantaged, so on and so forth. So that was important important to us in that it really matches New York State SUNY's mission in serving the underserved. And in this capacity building partnership that was funded by USAID for five years, we feel that we learned a great deal. We feel that our capacity was built as well and it was our opportunity to share lessons about the Middle East on the ground. So, and, and we know that that's important and it and will ultimately help us in finding the answer that you, for the question you <laughs> posed, but thank you. Thank you, Raif. And thank you so much to Jim Ketterer who has been part of this partnership from the very beginning. So it's very fitting that you are with us here today because you were with Rosemary. When Rosemary called me up and say, we have this, opportunity to partner with an institution in Lebanon called al Khafat University. What do you think of that? I said, I'm going to call Jim Ketterer. He'll know. So, thank you. But the, um, you know, the, so I do think that the, for all of the things that, that don't go right, the U.S. government does deserve some praise for funding that through higher education for, for development. Um, and, and that there are other programs that are going on below the radar. You know, we started this conversation by saying, you know, what are the kinds of things that you and I wish people could really know about the Middle East? And um, I think for me, it's to get beyond the headlines. Of course. Not that the headlines are, are unimportant. We, we need to understand what's going on in Aleppo and Mosul and, and in Cairo, et cetera. Um, but the, the kind of work that Al-Khafat uh, is doing, the sort of work that the U.S. government is doing with their, their um, English Access Micro Scholarship Program, that's the largest public diplomacy program in, in the world, teaching English to, to high school students from disadvantaged backgrounds across the Muslim world. You know, these sorts of things get, get no play at all, and maybe that's good. In a way, maybe it's good that they don't get too many headlines because it might undermine what they do, but um, you know, I always, and I, I, I'm sure you had the same sense, um, working uh, at the foundation and the university when I'd be going through Cairo. I was about to say driving through Cairo, but I was being driven for the record because I would be in a car accident instantly if I were driving. But I'd be looking down these, these long um, streets uh, and, and just thinking, you know, there are, there, there's potentially the, the next geniuses down there and they're not going to be able to find their way out. We've got to go down there and get them and bring them out. And that's exactly the work that, that you've been doing. And, so, and it is the work that, that I think the public diplomacy function of the U.S. government, um, as beleaguered as it is, as underfunded as it is, is, is still doing. And um, I just, I think we need to do more of it. Of course, I mean, higher education is the answer. You can't build a nation unless you have good, solid universities in there. I mean, this, is, this has been the contribution of the American people in 1866, 150 years ago, exactly 150 years yeah. ago, when Daniel Bliss started uh, the American University. At that stage, it was the Syrian Protestant College. Go back to this greater Syria. There was no Lebanon, there was no, no Syria. It was the, uh, you know, it was the um, SPC, the Syrian Protestant College. And because the Protestant had the first university, so you have the Jesuits 13 years later, to start St. Joseph University, and as in competition always breeds the best, like, so you had two higher schools of higher education that were in competition. School of Medicine, 
Cornelius van Dijk started the School of Medicine in, in Lebanon, 1866. We had a School of Medicine. So you had everybody from the previously defunct Ottoman Empire coming to study in Beirut. At the, and this has turned Beirut into the lighthouse of education in the Middle East. And this is what made Lebanon what it is today. Education, higher education. I mean, you can. I mean, we we we're working in Haiti today, and we go we go to Haiti. And the idea is, and there is nothing we can do unless we build the capacity of law of universities in in Haiti, because this is what you know brings the leaders of tomorrow, leaders in in government, leaders in in, in education, leaders in industry, leaders in everything. It has to be higher education. That was the main contribution, I think, not only of doing the university, but of bringing the Catholics to, 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 to competition. So I think this was, this was the... Um, the Lebanese university itself came after. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. The local university came much later. It, originally it was the uh, 1866, you know, the American University of Beirut, you know. Good. So I think we have time for one, one more question and maybe a follow-up from the ambassador. To Hi. Um, listening to you talk about uh, Lebanon before World War I has uh, brought up a couple questions for me. Uh, my grandparents came here in 1900, um, but you talked about this sort of greater Syrian kind of territory. And uh, Maishadu was very adamant he was not Syrian. And um, we, were, we were raised with this whole concept of Lebanese culture. Uh, what would be your opinion, the distinction? Why would there have been so much of a distinction? As an adult, I have learned that Arabic backgrounds, they are, the, the culture, everything's crossing. So what would be your take on the difference at that particular time, why he would not want to be Syrian and really wanted to be Lebanese? Um, until 1892, uh, all those who came from greater Syria were called the Turks, the Turcos in Latin uh, American countries. So I mean, if you look at the manifest, boarding manifest, coming from, say, Zgharta in, in, in modern day Lebanon, he would be a Turk. Between 90, 1892 and just about 90, the First World War, basically, there were Syrians. Like when my grandfather came here from Hadad, Lebanon, there's nothing more Lebanese than Hadad. He came as a Syrian. So he was Syrian. Because this was part of the Syrian province of the Ottoman Empire. So there was no actual Lib Lebanon. Lebanon was created physically in 1920. Before then, you had Mount Lebanon, but you didn't have Lebanon as such. So Lebanon became an entity in, 18, in 1920 with this French flag and the Syrian pinned in the middle. And then 1926, this is when we had our constitution. The Lebanese constitution was in 1926. There was no Lebanon before then. And why 1926? Because the French, the mandate would, have, would be over by 1926 because they only had six years, uh, which was, you know, the, uh, the mandate was given to them by the uh, precursor of the United Nations today, which was the Society of Nations. And they had six years to comply. So by 1926, they had to get a go away. And they gave us the Constitution. And the Constitution basically was Third Republic France Constitution, copycat. One addition, or two additions, in fact. The first would be the actual respect of community representations in politics. And that, 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 was, that was evil, basically. So it's like, you said, because you're Maronite Christian, you'd be president. Because you're Shia, you'd be sitting as president of the parliament, and, and so on. So this is when it started. Well, in fact, it started much earlier. But it was consecrated in the Constitution. And the second thing was kind of keep the French, tie the French in, into the, the actual uh, um, governance of the Lebanon. They had this in, into the Constitution. So 1926 was our Constitution. Before then, there was no Lebanon as such. Well, I want to make sure that we are able to do what we came here to do, which is to allow those people who wish to purchase copies of Rafe's book to do so. So we're going to adjourn to the other room. I'd like to thank first a round of applause for our two presenters. <laughs> I talked about the three principal partners, uh, SUNY System, our parent, SUNY Press, and of course the Rockefeller Institute, but I'd also like to acknowledge three organizations that really helped put this on, 
the International Center for the Capital Region. Diane, thank you so much. I'm proud to serve as president of that organization. The New York State Office of New Americans and the New York State Writers Institute who helped us in the promotion of the event. We're going to adjourn to the other room where we have some light refreshments. We have copies of the book and an opportunity for you to meet with the author. And one final note, we're going to gather here again on November 17th for a post-election consideration of immigration policy. It's going to be interesting. Uh, get out and vote. If you're not on our mailing list but you'd like to be here that day, please give us a copy of your business card or let us know how we can reach you. Thank you so much for being here. We stand adjourned.